Do you remember your first real job? Some of you that has to go a little bit further back than others of us in here. But mine was at Home Depot. I was the paint guy there. It was pretty cool because I had like a real paycheck. I had actually money put away for retirement and even vacation days. Blew my mind. But if I'm honest, it was really just a job. Do you know what I mean? It was just a job. I was just a guy there. And I remember in this particular store, we had multiple managers. There was one manager in particular who just, he always called me Jeff. <laughs> and I corrected him once, and next time he still called me Jeff. And I was a little confused because if you've been to Home Depot, you've got that big old bright orange apron, right? And smack dab on front, it says your name. <laughs> Dustin, right there. But for some reason, I was Jeff. So needless to say, it was, it was a great job for me at that time, but I'm going to be honest, I'm really glad I'm no longer there. It just wasn't a fit for me. Personally, I like this pastoring thing a little bit better. Working one day a week is really nice, right? <laughs> but maybe you're like I was back in my Home Depot days. You have a job and it's really just a job, right? You, you get your paycheck, you work hard, but really... It's just something you do. It's not something you really enjoy doing. Or maybe you even have a manager that always calls you Jeff. And that raises a question, if the call in Christ on my life is for me to walk in a manner worthy of my calling for Jesus in all arenas, everything in my life, what does that look like at work? In a job I don't like or maybe even hate? In a secular company? In a workplace where I'm just one of thousands of people there? What if I'm the boss or the manager? What about then? You see, just like we need a proper theology of marriage and of family, which we saw the last three weeks here in our text, we also need a proper theology of work. We need to understand how Christ is Lord of our marriages, our families, and our jobs. That's why I love the book of Ephesians, because we see Christ is going to touch every area of our life. And so we're going to be in Ephesians 6 this morning, Ephesians 6, verses 5 through 9. If you have it, you can go there. Otherwise, we'll have it up here on the screen. But if you could stand with me as we honor the reading of God's word, Ephesians 6, verses 5 through 9 says this, Bond servants, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart as you would Christ, not by the way of eye service as people pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart rendering service with goodwill as to the Lord and not to man, knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bondservant or is free. Masters, do the same to them and stop your threatening, knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven and that there is no partiality with him. Amen. You can be seated. Now, before we dive into our text, the first thing I think we just need to kind of get out there is that you need to realize that work itself is actually not evil. Work isn't a bad thing. I know many of us, that's, that's shocking, but hear me out. If you go back to the beginning, Genesis 2, we see that in Genesis 2, God actually gives the command to work. He creates work. Look, at me, look, look with me at Genesis 2.15. Genesis 2.15 says this, The Lord God took the man, and he put him in the Garden of Eden to work it, and to keep it. This was before the fall. This was before sin entered the world. And so work is not a product of the fall. We need to get that out there real quick because I think many of us think it is. That, oh, work is a bad thing. No, no, no. Work's a good thing, a godly thing. But we recognize there's just something wrong with work, isn't there? Something's not quite right. Because in Genesis 3, we see sin enters the world. And in that space, work now becomes difficult. Our work doesn't produce as easily or as quickly as it should. Go to Genesis 3 with me. Genesis 3, 17 through 19. This is the curse that God gives to Adam. And to Adam, he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and you have eaten of the tree of which I command you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken. For you are dust, and to dust you shall return. And so what we see here is we see that now we live in a world where work is, is still a good thing. It's not bad, 
but it is now toilsome and difficult because of the stain of sin. Crops don't grow like they should. Technology always seems to have some issue. People don't interact as they ought to at work. Things break down, our bodies included. And because of this work, because of this is where we're at, people now see work as something to overcome, something to survive until we enter that utopian state known as retirement. And then one day, after we do this retirement thing, we pass on to our glorious reward in heaven where what do we do? The same thing as retirement, right? That's our vision. Isn't that our vision of heaven? It's just like extended retirement, right? And I fear that when we view work this way, as some evil for us to endure or overcome, what happens is we miss out on the fullness of God's glory and plan. We all need to understand that work is a good thing, albeit a difficult thing. Why is work good? Well, the first reason work is good is because simply God told us it is good. If you go back to, again, Genesis 1, Genesis 1, 28, 31, it says this, And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens, over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit, you shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning the sixth day. You see, this verse right here that we just read, that's called the cultural mandate. Basically what it is, it's God's first command to mankind. The first thing God tells them, this is what you're supposed to do. And the first thing God tells us to do is what? Go and work. Go and do things for the cultivation and flourishing of our society in his name. That we're called to work for societal order. That we're called to use natural resources properly for our flourishing. And notice after God gives us the cultural mandate, what does he say? That this right here, this is very good. Not even just good, guys. This is very good. Work was created by God, and it is good because he has given it to us for our good and for his glory. But work isn't just good because God gives us work and tells us to work. Work is also good because God himself works. Go with me to John 5. Go over to John 5, 17. Get it here in a second. I'm sorry. John 5, 17, our text says this. But Jesus answered them, My Father is working until now, and I am working. God works. God's not just sitting up there just kind of hanging out, waiting for us to get up and have a big party. He's working. He's doing. So I get we can't work like God works, but because we are made in the image of God, we too, in some small way, are called to reflect His glory and that we too are called to work like He works, right? Right? We're called to do in some small way what he does in his big way. Our God works, and therefore it's not a bad thing to work. It's actually a godly thing when we engage in work. But the other reason why work is good is because the reality is we're going to have work to do for a long time, past retirement, in eternity. If you go back to Revelation, the last book in the Bible, Revelation 22.3 says this, No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. He has servants. That's us. That's you and me. Now, I know for some of you, this one may sting a little bit, but I'm just going to say, I don't think you're going to have time to sit around on a cloud playing a harp in heaven. I think we're going to have stuff to do. See, God has work for us. We are his servants. We are going to serve him. At the very least, it says we're going to be worshiping him. That's going to be an act of service that we do for him. But I do believe that our work in eternity may include other God-given tasks like we saw in the cultural mandate in Genesis 1. Things where we work for proper social order, where we harness the natural world for production. But the difference is in eternity, this time there's no more sin, no more curse. That no toil and weariness. We we don't need to retire. We don't need to have three weeks vacation every year. 
Our bodies don't break down. There's no meaningless or pointless tasks in eternity. There's no bosses who call you Jeff. Instead, we work in the glorious reality of eternity. Work in heaven won't feel like work does today. It's going to be joyful, holistically awesome and joyful in every possible way. And so even though our work today is stained with sin and the curse of the fall, we still need to see here before we dive in, there's a glimmer of goodness in our work because God created it as a good thing. That our work on this earth is still good, that there's purpose and meaning behind our work. Work is a good, necessary part of what it means to live in the image of God. If we are called to live in the image of God, we are called to, therefore, work. But if that's the case, we need direction, though, on how to actively live this out, lest we just drift back into treating work like a chore, right? So we need that proper theology of work. We need to understand work rightly, but now we need tips, advice. How do we live that? But before we get into that, there's one other thing we have to look at in our text, because there's an elephant in this room. You might not see it. Maybe you have seen it already. But in our text, there's a fairly large elephant. We got to deal with him. Look with me at verse 5. Ephesians 6, verse 5. Bond servants, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart as you would Christ. The elephant in the room is that term bond servants. We can't get away from it. It's the Greek word doulos, and it actually typically stands for slave. Okay, so they translate a bond servant here, but it's, it's slave is what it is. It means slave, okay? And so that begs the question then, as we're gathered here this morning, well, does the Bible condone slavery? Because we're, we're talking about it, right? The fact that Paul addresses slaves and masters here in our text, let's be honest, that's a little bit troubling, is it not? It, it's like, what, what's going on here? Paul, why didn't you just say, hey, no, no more slavery. Hey, get rid of this institution, end slavery. This is evil, this is wrong, stop it. But he doesn't do that. He just addresses the slaves and the masters. And as much as we could just gloss over this text and just move to employees and employers, the, the natural application today, see, I, I don't think we can do that because non-Christians won't do that. Do you know what I mean? Like, I, maybe you've heard this objection that, well, you know, you Christians, you, you condone slavery. Your Bible has slavery in it. So I don't want anything to do with that because slavery is wicked, so you guys are obviously off your rocker. Now, I don't have time to do too deep a dive into this topic, because let's be honest, that's not the main thrust or focus of this text. However, I do want to share two brief reasons why the Bible and Christianity in no way, shape, or form condones or supports slavery. So if you are confronted with this objection, you know how to address it. First, you need to understand that the biblical worldview throughout all of Scripture is clearly antithetical to slavery. If you actually read your Bible, you can no way say that Christians support slavery. I mean, think about it. In Mark 12, 31, Jesus commands us to love our neighbor. In Matthew 5, 44, Jesus commands us to love our enemy. In Matthew 7, 12, Jesus commands us to treat others as what? We want to be treated. Hard to be slavery there, right? Ephesians 4, 24, Paul reminds us that all people are made in the image of God. In 1 Timothy 1, 10, Paul writes that human trafficking is a vile, vile sin. It's very hard to justify slavery if you actually read your Bible. Instead of just cherry-picking a verse out and saying, ah, I got you. Read your Bible. If you understand who Jesus is, if you understand what Jesus lived and taught and what we stand for as Christians, you understand we are unabashedly against slavery. And when you, what's interesting is what, when you look at actually the most prominent people who helped abolish slavery in our continent and in Europe, do you know what you find? You find Christians. You find Christians. William Wilberforce. Frederick Douglass, William Lloyd Garrison, Harriet Beecher Stowe, Harriet Tubman. I could go on and on and on. The reason these people stood against slavery was because of their allegiance to their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You see, and so what we see, it's Christians who led the way for the abolition of slavery because they read and understood their Bible. People that try to use the Bible to justify slavery, I'm telling you, aren't open in their Bible. But the second reason, but, but in that space, if we see that, that the, the Bible clearly speaks against slavery, then that begs the question for us today, well, then why didn't Paul just say so? Why didn't Paul just say, hey, masters, don't have slaves any longer. Be done with it. He didn't do that, right? Well, why not? Well, this is where we have to understand that for Paul to write, hey, let's abolish slavery, that wouldn't have gotten very far. 
It really would have just been kind of a, a mute voice in amongst a sea of noise. While we notice that modern slavery, the idea of going and capturing people and stealing them and based on racism, that's not what he's talking about here. This is more like a bond servant, more like an indentured servitude, but still a, a wicked practice. It's still not right. But you have to remember that Christianity at this time that Paul is writing did not have the social influence it does today or during the American slave trade. Christianity was simply a tiny band of individuals trying to figure out how to navigate their new Christian life in a very pagan society. I mean, think about this. For Christians to try and overthrow any social institution at this time, let alone one like slavery that accounted for, hear this, one-third of the population in the Roman Empire. So this wasn't just a little thing in the corner. This was a massive part of the ancient world. For the Christians to say, hey, let's just throw this out and stop it right now, they would have been sheer lunacy. It would have been crazy talk. So what Paul does here, if you're going to notice in our text, he doesn't say, hey, just get rid of slavery. What he does is so much better. He subverts it and starts its demise from the inside. Look with me at Ephesians 6, 9. Masters, dressing the masters, the slaveholders, do the same to them and stop your threatening, knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven and that there is no partiality with him. Theologian Klein Snodgrass says this on this text, that masters are to treat their slaves the same way is cryptic, but still shocking. For them to follow this instruction, they would have had to treat their slaves with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart as to Christ. That alone should have abolished slavery for Christians. The ethics here move beyond the golden rule to treating others as we would treat our Lord. You see, Paul doesn't just say get rid of it because he's so much smarter than that. See, we're kind of foolish. We think, Paul, you should have said this. Yeah, and he would have crushed Christianity right there. Instead, he subverts it. He undermines it. And through Paul's wise words, we see it destroyed by Christians in time. You see, my hope is this is a very brief discussion, but I want you to see that Christianity, we are unashamedly anti-slavery, anti-racism in every way, shape, and form. Please don't let others use this as a straw man argument. Do you know what I mean? Some people say, see, I don't want to talk about my sin or my heart because there's slavery in the Bible. Well, you're, you, you just don't want to talk about your sin or your heart. That's the problem. You're going to throw out any excuse. Dinosaurs, slavery, because you don't want to deal with your heart. Don't let them do that. Get to their heart. Talk to them about the truth of the gospel. Don't let them throw out straw man arguments. So, with that out of the way, let's now take the concepts that Paul teaches in our text and apply them to the, the, most, the, the closest application we can see today, that of the relationship between employee and employer. And so in our text, the first thing we see is Paul addresses the servants, or for our application, those working as employees. Look at verses 5 through 8 with me. Bond servants, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart as you would Christ. Not by the way of eye service as people pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with, a good, with goodwill as to the Lord and not to man. Knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bondservant or is free. The only real command for the employees here is what? He only gives them really one thing to do. Obey. That's it. Obey. If you work for a company, listen to your boss. Obey your manager. Do what you're told to do at work. That's the only real command here. But then what Paul does over the preceding verses then is he basically unpacks that. He goes through what does this look like to obey, the kind of the principles and the grounds for it. And so let's unpack those things. First, he says, obey your earthly masters. Look at verse 5. Bond servants, obey your earthly masters. Isn't that a funny phrase? Your earthly masters? Why, why say it like that, right? The, the phrase earthly actually can mean fleshly. Your fleshly masters. It's a really strange way to talk. What Paul is saying here is he's saying, hey, your obedience to that boss or that manager, that person you work for, that's really obedience to another human, another sinful, fallen, dying human. And so we obey at work not because our boss or our manager is superior to us, not because they're always right or always good or because they, they've, they are a, a higher value than we are. That's not why we obey. We obey at work because we understand what Christ has called us to do here. Why do we obey? Christ, Christ tells us to obey. We listen to our Lord and obey. 
But we understand, and we'll see here in a moment here, is we, we ultimately obey. Why? Because we're obeying our greater heavenly master. That's why. As we obey our greater heavenly master, therefore let's obey our lesser fleshly, earthly boss. But then he tells us to obey with fear and trembling. Again, look at verse 5. Obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling. That, fear, that phrase, fear and trembling, it doesn't mean terror. It means don't be scared of them. That's unhealthy, obviously. Instead, we have a proper understanding and respect for the manager that God has placed over us. So even if we disagree with their worldview or their business decisions, we still show them a proper respect. Why? Because of the position they have and therefore the authority that they have in the workplace because God has instituted that order. Christians, therefore, are respectful to their boss. doesn't mean you always agree. doesn't mean you always do what they tell you to do even. But you are, at the very least, you are respectful, and we should be. Next, we're told to obey with a sincere heart. Verse 5 again. Obey with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart. That word sincere... It's translated elsewhere in the New Testament as generously, without division, or with integrity. In essence, what he's saying there is a sincere heart is a full heart. With the entirety of your heart and effort, obey at work. That means don't just go through the motions. Don't just check off the list and get home as quick as you can. Put some effort into things. Laziness is not an option at work. It's not. I remember I I was a professor for a time. And I would often tell my Christian students, hey, when I go talk to your professors, I better hear good things. You better be the hardest working student in that class. That doesn't mean you're the smartest. It doesn't even mean you're the best. But you better be the most honest, hardest working student in that class because you are a Christian. That's why. You see, that's what we're called to do. We are called to be wholehearted, sincere workers. You're called to work with that. And so think about your job. Are you wholeheartedly doing your job right now? Or are you just putting in time? Is it just a paycheck? Trying to check it off the list so you can go do the things you want to do out there? That's not what Christians do. We are called to wholeheartedly work at our job. But then with that, he also says we're to obey, not with eye service or people pleasing. Look at verse 6. Again, obey your earthly masters. How? Not by the way of eye service as people pleasers. Christians, We're called to be good workers at all times, not just when someone's watching you. Because I know you guys are really good workers when someone's watching you, right? Everyone kind of kicks it up a notch when the manager starts walking by. You see, that's not how it's supposed to be as a Christian. Rather, because of the integrity of our heart, because of our desire to live all areas of our lives for the glory of God and the good of creation, we work hard even if no one's watching us. I love what legendary basketball coach John Wooden said. The true test of a man's character is what he does when no one is watching. Are you honest when no one is watching? Are you a hard worker when no one is watching? Do you have full heart integrity when no one is watching? As those who have been ransomed by the blood of Christ, who desire to live high character lives for his glory, we don't just work when being watched. We don't just do the right thing when someone's standing over our shoulder. Instead, we work with our whole heart because it's the right thing to do. But then we get to verse 7, and he gives us here the ground of grounds, the biggest reason why we obey at work. Why do we work hard at work? Why do we obey at work? Why should we do these things? Verse 7 has the answer. Rendering service with goodwill as to the Lord and not to man. You see, when you work, you fulfill the cultural mandate of Genesis 1. When you're doing the job that you're called to live out, what you're doing is you're rendering service to God. You aren't just doing yard work, you're serving God. You aren't just working on some code and some data pieces, you're serving God. You aren't just taking care of the home and raising kids, you're serving God. You aren't just selling paint, you're serving God. And therefore, if we see it this way, if we understand everything I'm doing at work is in fact service to God, we do it wholeheartedly. We desire to work in such a way as to honor our Lord with our work. Because ultimately, we're serving God, not man. But this is the wrestle, isn't it? This is where we struggle because, I don't know about you, when I was at Home Depot, it sure felt like I was serving man, and he kept calling me Jeff. And so I'm like, why do I want to work hard for that guy? He can't even say my name right. 
What we have to understand is we so often feel like we're serving man. We're just doing that which is going to help some secular company meet some quarterly forecast or just lining the pockets of that rich guy ahead of us or just serving some entitled people. But in reality, all work you do is rendering service to God Almighty. You are serving Christ with your work. I love what Tony Meredith says. There really is no separation between secular work and sacred work. It is all work done under Christ. Do you hear that? See, some of you think, wow, look at Pastor. He's doing the sacred stuff, right? He's preaching the Bible and he's studying and counseling, do all this stuff. So he must be the sacred worker. Well, I've got this piddly job over here where I'm doing secular stuff. It doesn't really matter for eternity, right? Wrong. My job and your job is no different. It's sacred work when done for Christ's glory. Do you see your work that way? I mean, even the menial stuff, you know what I mean? Filing papers, just little stuff that you know, I I hate doing this, but I got to do it because it's my job. Do you see that as a chance to serve your maker? All work is sacred work when done for the glory of God. That's a lot about obedience there, right? That's a whole lot. Hey, you got to obey your masters, listen to them, do these things. But what if my company isn't so good? What if my company's asking me to do sinful things, things that are counter to the word of God? Do I still obey there? You've told me to obey. Okay, I can do that, but it's going to cause some problems with what you've called me to do in other sermons here at church. So what am I supposed to do? Well, as we've said the last few weeks, and I'll remind you again, obedience is never for sin. It cannot be. As employees, we don't obey our earthly masters or employers when it compromises our obedience to who? Our greater master, our heavenly master. Your heavenly CEO is is a higher position than your earthly CEO. And so work done that is not in line with God's word is always work done improperly. There's never an excuse for why it's okay this time. So anything that's done illegal, that's always wrong. Anything for the promotion of sin or for the degradation of the glory of God, we say no to Christians. Things like having a boss that says, hey, can you just change that number a little bit? It'll just look a little bit better on this report I got to give today. You can change it back afterwards, but just change it right now real quick. Christians, we're not cool with that. Or when your boss says, hey, you know what? I need you to work overtime every day this week, and I know it's going to affect your family, but I really need you to do it because it's really good for our company. Christians, we even say no to that. Or we ask to celebrate things that are not in line with the word of God. If the boss says, hey, we're going to do this. We're going to have this parade or party, and we're going to be a part of this. Christians, we, we say no to that. You see, Christians refuse to do things at work which are counter to the word of God. We refuse to go along with something or turn a blind eye to something if it's counter to the gospel. Now, again, don't be a jerk, okay? You don't got to be that guy at work that stands up in the middle of me and throws a desk and says, I'm not doing this. Please don't do that. Okay? There's a way you go about this, Christians, but we don't just go along with the flow of society. We stand to our obedience to our king above our obedience to our earthly masters. But for everything else in our work, the goal is obedience. The goal is to do that which is for the flourishing of our company as we obey. And I love the result of this. Look at verse 8 with me. He says, knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord whether he is a bondservant or free. I love that. That's such an encouraging verse. If you're struggling at work right now, memorize verse eight. Because what it says is, hey, all the work you're doing, guess what? God sees it. God sees your work. He sees the effort you put in when no one notices. He takes notice of your integrity and your hard work and your honesty, even when your boss doesn't care or notice. He sees it. He sees what you're doing when you're doing the right thing. Isn't that cool? Isn't that an encouragement? that my work matters to my king. Even the most seemingly mundane of tasks can be done in such a way as to exalt my maker and king and bring joy to him. It doesn't matter if it's big or little, secular or, secular or sacred. All things done in this way delights our king. So as you look ahead to Monday, and you think, man, I got this little task and this annoying thing I got to deal with, or this, this redundant thing, or your stay-at-home mom, and you got, I got kids that are just going to go crazy again this morning. Guess what? All of it is seen by your king, and all of it is for his glory. This reality should completely alter how we approach work, church. I mean, how can we treat each workday as something to muddle through when it presents us this awesome opportunity to praise and glorify King Jesus? 
And so employees, obey your boss. Listen to your manager. Come in and work hard. But in all of this, everything we do at work is about serving Jesus. He sees what you're doing. Just do it for his glory, honor, and praise. But maybe you're here today and you don't work for someone. Rather, you're the boss. You're the manager. You're the one in charge. Well, what are you supposed to do? Well, verse 9 is instructive here. Masters, do the same to them. And stop your threatening, knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and that there is no partiality with him. Bosses, managers, employers, whoever you are, how should you treat those working for you? What does it say? Treat them the same way. Do the same to them. Treat those working for you with respect. Treat them with a sincere heart full of integrity. I mean, just treat them as you want to be treated, right? Everything we've already said for employees can now be applied right back to the boss. I love how this idea echoes what Jesus said in Mark 10. Mark 10, 42 through 45, Jesus says it like this. And Jesus called to them and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles, they lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. And to give his life as a ransom for many. You see, if we believe this, managers, bosses, employers, it would change how we relate to people working for us. Because the people working for us are no longer just a means to a profitable end. They're no longer just cogs in the machine of our company. They're no longer lazy bumps that need a good kick in the pants. No, what they are is they are humans made in the image of God who need their Savior. That's got to change how we view our workplace. And if they're Christians, that means they're fellow heirs. You're no better than they are. They're fellow heirs with you. This concept, this idea would change how we manage. I mean, I don't read this in a lot of management books. You know what I mean? You guys might not know this. I went to a Christian undergrad school. I was a business management major. So I got to learn about theory X and theory Y management. Who knows theory X, theory Y? Couple people got it. You got to go back and remember your textbooks, right? Theory X says that humans are lazy beasts that you've got to kind of whip them into shape. They need extrinsic motivation. You got to get them going. Theory Y says, you know, they're actually pretty good. They just need a little encouragement and they'll get going. But you see both of them, they're still just a means to an end. They're a means to an end at the workplace. They're a means to your profit, your your exaltation, your management moving up the ladder. God's vision is so much different. They are people made in the image of God. They have value because they're made in the image of God. And we value them not because they are beneficial to our work, but because they are made in the image of God. Thus, we manage in such a way to help them see that. Now, again, what does this look in practice? Again, verse 9 tells us that masters are called to stop their threatening, knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and there's no partiality with him. And so he doesn't really give a lot of other things for these employers here. The only thing he tells you to do is what? Stop threatening. That's interesting. Just to stop threatening, right? You can coach them. You can teach them. You can train them. And even sometimes you might need to fire them. It doesn't say don't do that, because sometimes firing someone's the best thing for them. But just need to like pull it back a little bit. Don't be quite as worked up and, and amped up. Don't threaten them. Don't need to scream at them. Control yourself a bit here. But he says that ultimately the goal is to manage in such a way as for their betterment. Not just your advancement, ease or profit. Why? Because ultimately what he says is your boss and their boss isn't that manager above you. Your boss and their boss is in heaven. You're accountable to him for how you treat them. And with him... There's no partiality. So you better treat them as someone on equal footing. Now I get it, bosses, managers, CEOs, if you're in this room and you're doing pretty well at work and you're pretty high up that corporate ladder, you enjoy a social standing that's a bit higher than others in this room, for sure. You may carry that weight here, but I'm telling you, in eternity, your social standing means absolutely nothing. Nothing. You and your employee are both in need of the saving grace of Christ. And so treat them either as a fellow heir or as someone who needs to see that through you. And so we do the same for them. We show them respect. We honor them in that way because we want to show them Jesus. 
I mean, I love what this text, even though it's very short, do you see how this mindset shift can completely transform how we approach work and those who work for us? We can't treat them how the society says treat them. You see, when we view work in this light, whether as employee or employer, we get the chance to live in a redeemed version of work. Yeah, there's still toil and hardship. I don't mean that you follow these verses and tomorrow's just going to be easy at work. There's still hard things going on. Projects don't turn out how we plan. People still don't respond as we'd like them to. Forecasts and projections simply don't pan out. As many of us know, our bodies are wearing down physically, mentally, and emotionally. But even with all the hardship that work brings, when we understand it properly as a meaningful place of cultivation as God created to be, what happens is we learn to work even amongst the thorns and thistles of Genesis 3. That Christ didn't just come to redeem our souls, our marriage, our families, as awesome as that is. You guys need to hear, Christ came to redeem your work. He came to make your jobs new. He came to redeem how employees approach their jobs. He came to redeem how managers lead. He came to give your work, even the mundane and menial tasks, purpose and meaning. He came to do that. Well, how did he do it? How did he do that? Theologian John Frame says this. Redemption should be interpreted as God's reparation of Adam's failure and fulfillment of his original creation mandate through the second Adam, Jesus the Messiah. Whereas the first Adam betrayed his heavenly father and fell into sin by snatching after divinity, the second Adam proved his perfect loyalty by assuming the posture of a servant and humbling himself even unto the death of the cross. And by his perfect life and spotless sacrifice, Jesus became a vicarious atonement for sin and undid the evil that the first Adam initiated. Hear this last sentence. Moreover, the second Adam, Jesus Christ, is currently fulfilling the original mandate that God had given to humanity. He is perfectly fulfilling the original mandate. So now we get to walk into that space. You remember that command in Genesis 1? Subdue the earth, fill it. That, that thing that Adam failed in that we struggle at, Christ did it. He perfectly fulfilled that. And now through his sacrificial death, he invites us into that, into a better theology of work, into a redeemed vision for our job. But what's interesting is right before Jesus died, he didn't just go back to Genesis 1. It would have, been made, it would have made a lot of sense for Jesus to go, hey, now go, subdue the earth, multiply, fill. That would have made a lot of sense, a redeemed Genesis 1. But that's not what he did. He said Matthew 28, verse 18 through 20. Jesus says this right before he leaves. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So what are we supposed to do now? Like we're all supposed to quit our jobs and go be missionaries, right? We're all supposed to just stop working and y'all should be up here with me. We'll just be preaching in an empty room, all of us. Is that what we're called to do? No, I love what Professor Don Ponder, Doug Ponder says. He says, the first commission makes the Great Commission meaningful. The Great Commission makes the first commission possible. What we see is these two things, our first commandment we get in the Bible and the commandment Jesus leaves right before he leaves the earth, those two things are now related. Because of Christ and his call to make disciples, our work now has meaning beyond just putting in that nine to five until we retire. Now our work has purpose. We're called to cultivate, to work for the king. But then our text, Matthew 28, said it said go, right? That term actually means as you go, as you work, as you live, make disciples. And so now at our work, we go and tell others around us of the redemption of work. Hey, your work seems meaningless and toilsome, but there's more to it. You can serve your king this way. But Christ's Great Commission also now makes the cultural mandate possible. That we can actually work because Christ died so our, our work has value, has meaning, has purpose. We're no longer just putting in our menial tasks until we die. We're serving our king because of what he did. Our work, while still toilsome and difficult, does indeed bear fruit. We can now experience kingdom fruit at our work. I mean, this is why I just look back at my Home Depot days. Now, I'll be honest. I have a little bit of remorse. Because I look back and I was a Christian then. But I didn't get this. I mean, I worked hard. I, I maintained my integrity as a Christian at work. But work was just something I did to allow me to do the things I really wanted to do, including ministry. It wasn't a chance for me to live out the cultural mandate. I didn't see mixing paint as serving my king. 
I didn't see the, the opportunity to make disciples amongst my coworkers is something I was supposed to do. I was supposed to do that out there when I was doing ministry. This was my work. I'm just supposed to mix paint. That's all I do. My hope is that you're going to learn from our text today that your calling at work is so much greater than how much you like your job, how much you like your workplace or your coworkers or manager. The incredible gifting opportunities that God has given you to cultivate, serve, and minister is specific to you. I can't come to your work and do what you're doing. Your coworkers aren't going to say, hey, yep, come and tell me about Jesus. But they might listen to you. You see, that's the difference. God has put you there, no one else, for a purpose. And so don't take it for granted. Don't treat your work like a burden or your boss like a demon or your workmates like they have the plague. And said, see that Christ by his blood has redeemed your job. And now you get to work for his glory, honor, and praise. And so I pray each one of us will actually look forward to Monday this week. And not just this week, ongoing. Monday's not going to be that meme anymore, like, oh, it's Monday, right? Be, oh, it's Monday. I get to serve my maker. I get to serve my king. I get to make disciples because that's what Jesus called me to do.